Welcome to Jaw Talk. I'm your host, Dr. Tiffany Lamberton. Today, we're talking about my favorite topic, TM joint disorders, with a very special guest, my friend and colleague, Dr. Pete Lemieux. With over two decades of experience and a passion for pioneering TMJ diagnosis and treatment, Dr. Lemieux is here to share his journey, the groundbreaking role of modern imaging, and the power of interdisciplinary care. Whether you're a dental professional or someone curious about TMJ health, this episode is for you. Let's dive right into the show. Quick legal disclaimer. All information in this podcast is the opinion of the speakers and not meant to be a substitute for a diagnosis and consultation of a qualified healthcare provider. Hey everybody, this is Dr. Tiffany Lamberton of TMD Collective and this is another fabulous episode of Jaw Talk. I am so excited for my guest today, Dr. Pete Lemieux. Welcome to Jaw Talk. Thank you, Tiffany. I'm happy to be here. Yes, you're part of my Chicago study club, and I really wanted to have you on just to kind of share your perspective. But before we kind of get to like your journey with like TMJ and how you brought that into your practice, just tell our audience and our listeners a little bit about like who you are and what you're passionate about. Oh, certainly. Yeah. You know, I've got a restorative practice in Winter Park, Florida. I graduated a little over 25 years ago. I've got a just a you know, I, I wouldn't call it a boutique practice, but, you know, we're, we're tiny. We get four operatories and we, you know, we do a little bit of everything, you know, crown and bridge and implants and whatnot. I started doing uh, joint stuff maybe about seven, eight years ago, uh, but I've always been kind of joint conscious. I started early on taking, you know, some, some continuing education with the Dawson Academy and Spear and Panky and learned about joints back then and, and never... I really was paying attention to it until, you know, maybe a few years ago. So, yeah, you know, yeah. I'm kind of like, I've just got an average practice. Yeah. Well, and I love that, you know, you have basically taken a busy restorative practice and started to look at things, you know, kind of more under the surface of like paying more attention to, like you said, TM joints, airway, and starting to really incorporate modern imaging like cone beam CT that shows that full field of view, Mm -hmm. and then also MRI of the TM joints. And I think that that is sometimes as a restorative dentist or a general dentist, that can sometimes be intimidating because that's not really something that we learned in dental school. And I know, you know, when I first got introduced to, you know, Dr. Jim McKee and Dr. Mark Piper, kind of back in 2012, you know, from, for me as being a PT before a dentist, it was like, finally, someone's talking about the joints and how can we assess that? You know, where, where was kind of that light bulb moment for you? Yeah. You know, it's true. They don't, they don't teach us about cone beam and MR, uh, at least when we went to school and I, I, I'm very doubtful that they're teaching it now in in dental school. So it's scary. You know, you don't know, how to order it you don't know how to read it but once once someone shows you it's it's pretty exciting because we have learned about the anatomy you know we all went through gross anatomy in dental school so we know structure and you know once somebody starts to show you things on imaging whether it's cone beam or mr it's it's kind of exciting because you're starting to recognize things and and the more you see and the more you start to manipulate the images and, and navigate through slices, it's infectious. It's, it's hard to not want to see it. So I, it's been a, an exciting new uh, change for me. And, you know, once you start seeing things through imaging, you, you just can't unsee them. And you start to recognize things in, with your patients just when they sit down in front of you and almost at hello, you start to see their changes even before you start to image. So I, that's been pretty neat. Yes. And I think what's also really exciting is, you know, there's a lot of attention right now in cranial facial growth and development in children, you know, recognizing airway issues in children. And I think when we start bringing in that piece of modern imaging, even with MRI, we're surprised that even in young kids, there's, there's young kids that have very severely damaged TM joints that we're seeing in kind of that pre-orthodontic patient. Could you talk about how you've kind of brought that into your practice with younger patients? Yeah, that's such a good point. You know, 
in, in my practice, you know, we, we rely on our referral, our specialists to do certain things. You know, I, I don't do orthodontics. I, I don't take out impacted thirds. You know, we do see a lot of pediatrics, but I think what's important to your point is to recognize the potential for these, these structural changes to affect growth. And so I've kind of brought my pediatric dentist and my orthodontist along for the ride with me and tried to get them up to date. So they're, you know, they're often the first line of defense when these kids show up at their practices. That's the first opportunity for these kids to be recognized. So when my pediatric dentist or my orthodontist sees, you know, something in the jaw structure, maybe their function that is suspicious of a joint based problem, they reach out to me right away so that I can image them and, and kind of give them a green light or a yellow light or a red light, if so to speak, before they begin treatment. And I think, you know, they, they've potentially got the biggest potential for impact on, on these children. By the time I see them, they're often, it's too late. They're 18, 20, you know, 30 years of age, and we've missed some opportunities to help them grow properly. And now we're dealing with joint problems. I'm still happy to recognize them and help them, but the options for them are now going to be different. So yeah, it, it's a team effort, you know? Yeah. Well, and you do such a beautiful job. You know, you've pre presented some cases to the Chicago study club. You know, you do such a beautiful job of the case presentation. So that yeah. takes a lot of time to do, yeah. you know, clinical photos, yeah. you know, the assessment of the comprehensive exam, and yeah. then to, you know, kind of work through all of the imaging. When did you start, you know, kind of, pushing the envelope a little bit with, with putting those cases together. Yeah. You know, so it just kind of mirrors the way I practice, you know, when a, a new patient comes in to my practice, a regular new patient, for example, it, it's not a five minute exam during a hygiene visit. I, I, I've always been taught to spend an hour, hour and a half with a new patient and, and we look comprehensively at, you know, we do a cancer exam and we do a joint exam and look at the occlusion. So when a patient comes to us, and, t and typically it's a it's a referral from my orthodontist or my pediatric dentist, and they are concerned about a joint issue, I'll set aside an hour and a half specifically to look at their joint. And it starts off like it should, just with a detailed history. And you know, I've got I've got some forms that we've we've put together to make it easy and streamline. My assistants can start the forms, but I'll sit down and. You know, sometimes I'll spend, you know, it's it's at least 20 minutes and sometimes we're talking for, for 40, 45 minutes. Just what's going on? You know, how long have you felt this? How does it bother you? Do you have pain? Does your jaw lock? All these questions before I even lean them back, you know, the, and the history of you know, trauma and how long have they had orthodontics? Did they have elastics or headgear? There's so much to learn. Mm -hmm. And you, as you're talking to them, you're, you're putting together you know, kind of a theory in your mind, what might be happening. And then I lean them back and I do, you know, a, a joint exam. Like I, I was taught in dental school. We look at the range and path of motion. We load test the joints, listen for clicks and pops. And then I look at the occlusion. And I document what I see with guidance and looking for cants and midline shifts and, you know, cross bites. And if I think they've got a joint issue, then I sit them up just like I would do with a comprehensive patient. Okay, this is what I'm seeing and this is what I think the next step needs to be. And, and oftentimes for these patients, it's, you know, they understand we, we need to image this. This is, this is like a bad knee. If you've had a ski accident, you know, the doctor's not just going to wiggle your knee and, and slap a knee brace on and send you home. They want to know what you've damaged. And they get that when you start using an analogy like that, they get it. And it's, they don't, they don't have very, many people question the need for imaging and I tell them, listen, be before we treat, we have to diagnose. That's the most important thing. And, and with the diagnosis, not only can I tell you what's been damaged, you know, and maybe we're lucky and nothing's damaged. Maybe these are all unrelated to your joint, but we're going to find out. But if there's damage, I'm going to tell you where, what's damaged, how bad it is. And I want to tell you what your risk factors are, what the prognosis of your joint is if we do nothing. And then that leads into a discussion of treatment options. You know, just like a bad knee, some people can live with a knee brace and not get that ACL repaired. Some people need surgery and, you know, not, not everybody wants surgery, but at least they know that 
what their options are. Yeah. And you have a, like a very unique opportunity because you get to work very closely with Dr. Brian Shaw, who is an amazing uh, oral surgeon who does a lot of, you know, TMJ surgery and who's really, in my view, groundbreaking, you know, and, yeah. and really pushing the envelope with, you know, yeah. minimally invasive TMJ surgery. Could you talk yeah. a little bit about that uh, yeah. dynamic that you have working oh. together with Dr. Shaw? Yeah. Yeah, no, I, I'm certainly spoiled. I, I'm, you know, he's not next door. He's he's a two hour drive, but it's not a hard sell. And yeah, he, I, I think, you know, I tell my patients, he's the best person on the planet, you know, to fix a job problem. And for a two hour drive, it's worth it. So it is helpful because I'm, I'm not a surgeon. You know, I, I can't, I can't fix the problems that I'm finding, but that should not be understated. The patients are so thankful to have someone tell them, what's wrong. They've been searching sometimes for years and they've tried things that, that haven't worked and they've spent money on, on fancy splints and they've tried Botox and they've tried mm. aromatherapy and, you know, everything <laughs> and, and nothing's working, you know, and you finally yeah. show them what's wrong and they're, they're thankful. E even though I, I feel sometimes ineffective because I can't fix it. You know, Dennis, we want to fix things. But I think our greatest power is to be diagnosticians and, and to discover and diagnose things first, you know, and, and I think that's extremely valuable. So anyway, once we find a problem, you know, we have a discussion if the, you know, some people they're ready, they want to get this fixed. They've been in pain. I don't want to mess around with another splint. I'm tired of medications. Let's get this thing on the road and let's get it fixed. So we send them down to St. Pete. And Brian does an excellent workup. He's, it's a 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. kind of experience, I tell them. They get a hotel room the night before and they start off with a, kind of mirroring a lot of what I've done in my hour and a half. So there's a little bit of repeat, but then they go into greater detail. They've got some videos and they get another scan, uh, a more comprehensive MR series that I'm going to take. I'm, I'm taking a screening set. And then before they leave, they have a conversation about their diagnosis and treatment options and payment and costs and everything else. And so it's, it's a good experience. And I've, I've had a chance, my very first patient, I should tell you the story about him in a moment, but my very first patient, I, I brought him down to back then it was, it was Mark Piper. Brian hadn't joined the practice yet. And I shadowed my patient through the exam process just so I could see what they're doing, how they do it. I wanted to make sure it, it passed my smell test. I wanted it, you know, I wasn't certain at the beginning if this was all reliable content. And with everything I had learned through my other avenues of education, I was sold immediately. So I had a chance to shadow the patient. And then I went down a second time and shadowed Dr. Piper and Dr. Shaw at that time. I shadowed them. I wanted to see what their day was like in clinic, running from patient to patient. So I got to see patients who were in there for the first time and patients who had just had surgery three days earlier. And I, I just wanted to see their work pace. And then I went down a third time and watched joint surgery on one of my patients. And that was That's so cool. It was really, <laughs> yeah. So yeah, so I'm spoiled, right? He's two hours away and I get to do this, you know, without much, much effort. So yeah. Yeah, it was pretty neat. And then talk to us a little bit about the restorative piece of that once they have had that mm -hmm. surgery. So Dr. Shaw does a lot of autologous fat grafting where he basically, if the disc is dislocated and can't be replaced, you know, he'll take out the disc and then kind of take some abdominal fat and he calls it like a double stuff Oreo into yeah. the joint. <laughs> yeah. And then the patient's in a splint for nine months. But then once they're kind of done healing from that surgery, then sometimes those patients have a posterior open bite and they need yeah. to have some um, restorative dentistry. Could you talk yeah. about what that's like? Yeah. So that's right. After nine months, then, then he sends them to me and for an occlusal evaluation. And so we'll bring them in and we'll take some photographs and, and scan, you know, scan their bite and get some mounted models and just to see where they're at. And, you know, from time to time, the, the bite needs minimal work, just a little, a little dusting of a cusp here, or maybe some, some simple additive work to get that bite level. You know, the goal is to support the joint with an even posterior occlusion 
you want shallow guidance, you know, sometimes maybe a little group function can help. So sometimes the, the bite changes are minimal and it's just a, just a little bit of additive dentistry. I'll do a, maybe a composite overlay on a, on a couple of second molars, but other times, you know, we, we have to maybe coordinate with an orthodontist to, to move some front teeth out of the way, you know, increase that overjet a little bit to, to work the bite. So, so it varies, but the goal remains the same. You just want to have an even balanced occlusion that they haven't been off. So I'll I'll state that again. I haven't had any patients who've required more than that, but it's possible. We've got a patient right now who's, who's getting worked up for, for surgery. And our expectation is she'll need a two stage surgery. She'll need the fat grafts and she'll need orthognathic surgery. So that's a possibility as well that they're going to need you know, more in, and Dr. Shaw does a pretty good job kind of showing what we should expect and anticipate. So it's I'm like just there true to interdisciplinary me. care, right? It, absolutely. Yeah. Like it should be. Yeah. So it's a team. I, I've got Shaw doing the surgical side and my orthodontist helping me out with the orthodontic side. And then I'm, I'm there just to put the, the, the frosting on the cake, if you will. So, yeah. 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 What would you say to a young dentist who is maybe like interested in kind of like the continuing education part of it? You know, we're lucky because we're in this like, I'm going to call it an elite (laughs) study club with Dr. Jim McKee, Dr. Drew McDonald, Dr. Kurt Ringhofer and Dr. Seth Adkins, our Chicago study club. It's just an amazing group of dentists. It's a very like supportive community and always I feel like pushing the envelope. Yeah. What would yeah, you say you, you to could, a young dentist that needs mentoring or where, where do you, where would you start? Yeah. I you know the, you got to start with a, with, with a foundation of knowledge and, and then you got to find a support group where you can ask all those questions that are nagging you in the back of your mind and, and someone who's not too busy to talk to you, you know? So that's, what's beautiful about our study club. We've got the ability to, to with an email or a group chat, just to ask questions, but to get that baseline knowledge, you know, there are some resources out there. I, I, I think, you know, Pete Dawson's book's a good start for basic joint anatomy and, and he talks about occlusion and how to balance that occlusion. Mark Piper has a has an excellent chapter on joint structure, you know, disc positions and joint classifications, how you can expect the bite to change as the joint is injured in different degrees. Awesome. You know, back when I was learning this, there were some courses that that were offered by the Piper Clinic, and I those are hard to come by nowadays. So there there may still be some online content, but the chapter that he's written is is very good. So I would start with that, and then you've you've, you've got to find a group of people who are doing it to show you how to put the concepts into action, okay. and to show you how to streamline it so that. You know, it's not an anchor in your practice. So this is this is fun for me to have this. I, I almost feel like I've got a superpower, right? Like I can see things that my fellow dentists aren't even not noticing. And it's not a drag. But when these patients come in, I'm excited that I have a chance to help them in ways yeah. that, you know, other dentists are just confused about. So, so once you start gaining this knowledge, it, it's addictive, but you need support. You need to make it, you've got to set up some systems so that when they come in, you're prepared and you can work through it. And you know, there's, there's, you got to adjust your fees a little bit to make it worth your while. And, but it, it has not been an obstacle at all. It's, it's, it's growing our practice and I'm not even trying, you know, I'm, I'm trying to be quiet about this because <laughs> You know, if I let too many people know, it's going to overrun me. And I do enjoy doing other dentistry. Like I still enjoy the cosmetics and the, you know, helping out the little old lady who, who needs a denture fix. I'd like those things. Yeah. So this isn't, this isn't the entirety of my existence, but it's become a pretty, 
pretty awesome part of it. Like you're part of like a network too. So, you know, there, you know, I'm in the Seattle area, but someone may message me on, you know, Instagram, I need someone in Florida. So, wow. you know, it's always like a great resource to have like-minded dentists across the country because people are finding the resources. They're, they're seeking them out. So they want to have, like you said, they want to have answers. And, you know, that chapter that you mentioned out of Robert Kerstein's book that Dr. Piper wrote, all I'll make sure I link that in, in our show notes. And also a shout out to also Dr. Dania Tamimi and her book, yes. Specialty Imaging yes. and Sleep, you know, Temporal Mandibular Joint and Sleep Disordered Breathing. Yes. She's a fabulous resource yep. if, you know, if you want to take her course to learn more about interpreting cone beam CT, MRI, you know, she yep. kind of brings the, the airway and the TM joint perspective, the interpretation. So her book is, is kind of a Bible for me also. So yep. both of those resources, I think yep. are fantastic. Yes. Yep. I would love to have you just share a little bit. We just got back last month from AES in Chicago uh -huh. and you were a panelist. Yeah. Could you share with our listeners who was on the panel with you and what did you talk about? Oh yeah, that was such a nice opportunity. I'm just thankful to even have that chance to present at the AES. Again, you know, a little restorative guy like me from Winter Park to talk into this great group. <laughs> you did so fantastic. No, no, thank you. <laughs> so yeah, I was on a panel alongside two other doctors. It was Lynn Lipskis, who's a, a dentist in the Chicago area I had never met before. And Dr. Leanne Brady, who many of us know from the Panky Institute. So I, I know Lee, I learned from her when I was at Panky. So I really, you know, looking forward to sharing the stage with her. Uh, so the three of us were given a fictitious patient and we were asked to share our perspective on this patient. How would we handle this patient if they walked in our practice Monday morning? And it was basically like a 20 something year old female patient walks in with a class two occlusion and she's got symptoms in her left joint. And then she's got a history of orthodontics, which was, which lasted over four years, including the use of headgear. And that was it. We weren't given pictures or anything else, imaging. So, you know, they said, okay, what would you do with this patient? And so uh, Lynn Lipskis, you know, has a, has a joint based practice and, and she talked how, you know, she might look at certain things like posture and some things that I wasn't completely familiar with, but she, you know, she, she shared her perspective on there. And then Lee spoke about, you know, communication and learning more, you know, being present in the, you know, staying in the question, if, if not just trying to find out how this patient's bothered by their symptoms. But for me, it was, this, this is a patient that I, that I regularly see. So it was very easy for me to share how I would do it. And I, I said, you know, already I'm kind of suspicious. They've got joint symptoms and their bites off a little bit. Maybe this is a clue in the orthodontics over four years with head gear. I'm like, gosh, these are all starting to add up. So the first thing I want to do with this patient is assess their joint condition. Right. I just want to know, is, is this a potential joint based problem? And I talked about the different joint anatomy structures, you know, you've got intact joints and you've got structurally altered at the lateral pole. And then you've got those that are altered at the medial pole as well. And I said, you know, if it's just a lateral pole issue, we can probably take care of this patient at the tooth level and, and correct their occlusion orthodontically, or if, if necessary, anathically. But if I thought I was a medial pole problem, I thought, you know, this is going to be a risky kind of patient to treat at the tooth level and I would want further information. And then I went on to talk about how, you know, how do you tell the difference in your practice between a, a lateral pole and a medial pole? They don't come in labeled in, <laughs> you know, so, so one of the ways that, that I was taught to recognize some of these risky patients is by reading the occlusion. And we can, we could all do that. And you look at a patient's, you know, look for asymmetries in their face. Is their, is their chin pointed to one side? Are they retrognathic? Do they have an anterior open bite? Mark Piper talks about the rule of twos, right? Two millimeter overjet, two millimeter midline shift, or two millimeter open bite. If you see any of those, you have to suspect a medial pole problem. And those types of joints, you gotta, you gotta work cautiously through an image. So I talked about how do you image? Well, we need two types of imaging. We need a cone beam to see the hard tissue so we can see cortical plate integrity and ramus lengths and joint spacing. And I think Mark Piper says 
you know, the cone beam shows you what happened, gives you a view into the rear view mirror, and then you need an MR to look forward to see what's coming, what are the risks. So with, with MR, you're looking at the soft tissue. So we can see the position and condition of the disc. And what's really cool, depending on the setting, you can see if there's any inflammation, you know, the edema or the effusion in the joint that can indicate how risky they are. So once we have the imaging, we talk about prognosis, we talk about risks, and depending on what we see can determine how risky this is for the patient. You know, some, some joint problems we can live with. We can maybe promote healing and adaptation. It's never gonna be a perfectly healthy, normal joint again that has been structurally altered, but they might be tolerable, you know? And then there are others that are extremely high risk. You know, the little tiny joints that are have minimal surface area or the giant disc that's an obstruction or the ones that have active cortical plate breakdown. You, you really have, don't want to touch those. And, you know, you talk about treatment, but sometimes you talk about what not to do. And that's just as important for these patients. So the, the very first patient that I, that got me into this was similar to this fictitious patient. And he, I inherited him too late. But by the time I met him, he had already gone four or five steps down the wrong rabbit hole, mm. right? And by the time I saw him, he had done orthodontics, he had done orthognathic surgery, and he was still having a problem, right? So it's, it's equally important to tell them what not to do as it is what to do, and you kind of guide them through it. So this, this patient, if you don't mind, I'll talk about him real quick. Yes, please. So 22-year-old 20, young man awesome kid comes in and he had just had orthognathic surgery to correct an anterior open bite. He shows up with a posterior open bite because they did a, a maxillary impaction and they overcorrected because the expectation sometimes in the oral surgery world is that there's going to be some relapse. Okay. What does that tell you? <laughs> Maybe it's not stable, right? But so as I'm looking, I'm obviously looking at 2020 hindsight, right? So he was having some joint symptoms. He had this posterior open bite. And at the time I wasn't completely joint aware. I had learned through education that when a patient has a joint problem, it's because their bites off. And here's a young kid who clearly had a bad bite. I'm making the connection. Well, obviously I've got to get his bite fixed and I don't want to jump in and fix his bite right away. So I, I made him a flat plane splint and I got his bite as perfect as I could on the splint and I had him wear it as much as he could for two or three months and he got just a little bit better but not significantly better and i it confused me i quote i'm doing everything right if if the bite caused the joint problem he should be better so that's when i brought him down to piper we did the workup we did the imaging and immediately became clear to me that it's not a bite problem that causes a joint issue it's a joint problem that causes a bite issue Right. So when the, when the disc comes out of position off of the condyle and the condyle seats, the whole jaw rotates back. You've got this, this premature contact on the back tooth now because of the joint change and you have an anterior open bite. So the cause is the joint. If you fix it with an orthognathic solution and they still have a joint problem, it's going to relapse. And that's what happened to this kid. So he, now he has to go down and have joint surgery. But we can't we can't use orthognathics as a tool anymore because apparently you can only do one maxillary jaw, otherwise you risk sloughing the whole maxilla if you try to do a second stage orthognathic treatment. So it's important to guide them in the proper steps in the proper order. If the problem's here, you got to fix this first. You can't camouflage it up here if this is still actively changing. So that was an eye opener, right? That's not a bite problem that causes a joint issue. It's a joint problem that causes a bite issue. Yeah. You know. Well, and I think especially, you know, kind of going back to, you know, educating your orthodontist in your area too, is, you know, basically taking all of this imaging and this workup that you've done and kind of serving it to them and saying like, okay, you have this 12 year old patient, you know, especially I think females, you know, greater than males tend to have more joint 
and then ligament laxity and saying like, you know, this patient, their joints aren't healthy enough to undergo the proposed treatment. You know, here are the the options and, and the things, you know, that yeah. they can consider. But I feel like I've gotten so much pushback from some of the orthodontists in my area, yeah. you know, but I'm, you know, trying to improve my verbal skills as well. Yes. And yes. <laughs> yeah, you get a lot of resistance when they don't, they haven't seen, they haven't seen the other side of things. So you get resistance from other dentists who question why you're doing this. You get resistance from your specialists. The surgeons sometimes are resistant to it. Even the radiologists sometimes, when you sit down to work with them, this is new to them. Not many people are asking for TMJ imaging. So yeah, you're, you're fighting an uphill battle on the learning curve. But once you find a team, everybody gets it. And I mean, I have lunch every week with my orthodontist and I tell you, we're, we're talking joint stuff all the time because it's, again, it's, it's new and it's exciting and we're making a difference. And, yeah. you know, Tiffany, I thought when I learned about this in, in dental school, I thought, oh, goodness gracious, I hope I never see a joint patient. This sounds so scary. <laughs> and I, I'm hoping I can escape through my, my next 40 years of career and never see a single joint patient. And now I see them all the time. I feel like, uh, what's his name in the sixth sense? You know, like, like I see dead people, you know, <laughs> they're all around us. So I see joint problems all the time and they're not scary, right? It, once you know how to diagnose them, these patients are, are, they're just begging for help and begging for understanding. And they've gone places and they've been put on medications and said, well, get, get over it. It's, it's in your head or here's some Botox and they fix a muscle problem that was there because the muscles are in spasm trying to support a bad joint. Now you've taken their protection away from them and they're not getting better. And once you find out what's going on and you can help them, they're, they're thankful. I had one patient come back to me two months after her surgery. She was still in splints and, or, you know, she had the rubber bands and surgical braces and she wasn't even a patient of mine. She had been referred in and she came into my practice two months after surgery and was crying with appreciation. And I didn't know this, but she, she told me she had been suicidal before her surgery. And like, she credits me for saving her life. And mm. like, oh my That's goodness. A powerful story. Right. Like, like, I'm not making this stuff up. It's, it's happening, you know? So it's, you can make a nice difference for people and it, it can fit it into your practice. It doesn't have to be to the, you know, the sole thing you do. Mm. So I, I, I kind of feel like I've become kind of a pseudo specialist in town. I, mm -hmm. Clearly there's no specialty, recognized specialty in joints, but I'm getting referrals from, from my orthodontist and pediatric dentists, but I'm also getting referrals from my local study club members. I, I lead a, a small spear study club and I'm bringing them up to speed, trying to educate them. So they're recognizing things and, you know, to their credit, they're, they're not really ready to jump in there and do it but they're recognizing it and they're sending their patients to me for a quick, you know, assessment. And I think that's the first step, recognize it first. And then once you start recognizing it, start to try to diagnose it, you know, start with cone beam, try to find an imaging center who knows how to image a joint. You know, there's a, there's a protocol and a learning curve there. And just kind of work your way into it. It's not going to happen overnight, but slowly work your way into it. And then, I think it can make a nice difference and, and you're doing what you should be doing. You're being comprehensive for your patients. Yeah. Well, and I like to say having that modern imaging plus your comprehensive exam is almost like having a crystal ball, especially in these young kiddos in that pre-orthodontic condition, because yeah. it, it tells us whether their, their joints and their airway are healthy enough to undergo the proposed treatment, no matter what the treatment is. Right. You know, like right. you said, is it surgery? Is it orthodontics? Is it a functional appliance? Right. Is it physical therapy? Is it a, a splint therapy? You know, it, having that data and that information really like allows us to work together as that true interdisciplinary team and that that yeah. provide the optimum care for our patients. So yeah. yeah. got to keep preaching. <laughs> yes. Spread the word. Yes. I just right. I just I had a presentation last week. 
I mentor the, the pre-dental students at our local university. University of Central Florida has a great, great group of pre-dental students. Awesome. And I could talk to them about anything and they'd be just, you know, enamored with just having a dentist there. And, but I chose to talk to them about TMJ stuff because nobody else is that. obviously talking to them. And so they were eating it up and they're like, well, yeah. why aren't more people doing this? And, and, you know, how do we, how do we do this? How do we learn? So it starts here. You got to recognize it and just keep your eyes open. What I love too is just that digital workflow is changing how we practice too. And, yeah. you know, I think that the technology is happening so fast and the, the new dentist that's coming out. And like you said, the new dentist that's going into dental school right now is going to have a completely different experience because of how our profession has, has, you know, really pushed itself forward. So yeah. I think it's, I love that modern imaging has, has pushed our profession to, to yeah. be better and to do better. Yeah. Yeah, 25 years ago when we were in dental school, I, I don't know that I knew what a cone beam was. I knew what an MRI was, but certainly cone beams were not something in my vocabulary. And now we can scan. and It's, yeah. So there are some nice tools that make this efficient. And having a cone beam now is an affordable piece of equipment in your practice. You got to make sure you have a big enough field of view. I bought one three years ago and it was just barely big enough, but frustratingly too small. So I'm, I'm replacing my cone beam next month with a bigger field of view. So nice. a little learning curve nice. there. But, yeah. Do you mind if I ask which company you decided to go through? Well, so I, my choices were very limited because I have a small little corner in my practice where my old digital pan came out of. So most of the machines are, are too wide for that space. So I ended up going with the Cavo OP3D initially, which is a great machine. And the field of view, I, I wish I could tell you what the field of view was. The, their biggest field of view was was just barely big enough. And I got to like tip the patient's head back to get the whole ramus in. And sometimes they get artifacts on the perimeter. But they just came out in October with the 3D LX. And it's the same footprint. and But it's got a much bigger field of view sensor. But I've got other doctors in town who are using CareStream. And those images look great. And... Initially, I wasn't, I had to use the CT at my imaging center, which really nice images, but your exposure to radiation was a little bit higher than I really want to expose my patients to. Mm -hmm. So I think a cone beam is the way to go, obviously. Yeah. Awesome. Mm -hmm. Well, what do you have going on in the future that you're excited about? Give a shout out to, you know, we've got our May meeting with the Chicago study club, which yep. sounds like it's going to be amazing. Yeah. Lots of cool. It sounds like they're changing a little bit about the structure of that. What other things do you have coming up that you want oh, to Oh gosh. You know, it, my, my past six weeks have been such a blur. It's been nice just to have emptiness in my brain for a chance. <laughs> but no, I, I am looking forward to uh, reconnecting with everybody at the Chicago Study Club in May. We just had our little virtual meeting earlier this week, which was, it's always fun sharing cases and seeing people virtually, but getting together live and is, is awesome. So we've got that. You know, I don't know that I've got anything pressing at the moment, but my my calendar is 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 ripe and ready for for something fun to come along. I'm looking forward to the to next year's AES meeting, and that's always a good good group to get together with. And then, you know, maybe I'll take a look at the Spear Summit as well. Awesome. Awesome. Well, and like I said, you, you know, anytime you're up here in the Pacific Northwest, you got to look me up and we'll do a hike together or go, go okay. out on the boat or something. So yes, absolutely. we're just having like a absolute fantastic day where it's just like you can see Mount Rainier and the oh. Olympics and like, <laughs> yeah, love, yeah. love it here on, yeah. on days like that. So yeah. Yeah. But thank you so much, Dr. Pete, for coming on to Jaw Talk. This has been such a great, really fun discussion. And like I said, we'll put all of your information in the show notes where people can find you. We'll link that chapter in Dr. Piper's book because that's an awesome resource. And thank you so much for being a part of the show today. Yeah, thank you, Tiffany, for inviting me along. I was happy to do it. And that's a wrap. Another amazing episode of Jaw Talk. A huge thank you to Dr. Pete Lemieux, my colleague and friend. Thank you so much for joining us and sharing your insights about interdisciplinary care and bringing the TM joints and modern imaging into the dental practice. If you enjoyed this episode, please consider a paid donation uh, either on our Patreon account or you can support the show for as little as $3 a month. Your donation helps us 
us continue to bring amazing content to the show. And as always, a five-star reviews are always welcome and also share this podcast with your friends so we can gain greater visibility in the podcast community. So thanks again for joining me. And until next time, stay humble, stay curious. I'm your host, Dr. Tiffany Lamberton of TMD Collective. See you next time.